Hello everybody, Christina Previtt here and welcome to the PT on Ice Daily Show, Jerry on Ice edition. Are you guys starting to get sick of me yet? I feel like I've been on the podcast a lot lately and loving it. Um, so I am one of the lead faculty with Dustin Jones in Modern Management of the Older Adult. Uh, if you guys are interested in any of the offering of the Older Adult Division, we are actually in Camarillo, California this weekend. It's actually the first time I'm going to be away from my little baby. Maya is four months old. Um, and so this is going to be the first time that I'm away with her, but dad's going to do a great job. Um, but we're in Camarillo, California, and then we have our next online cohort for modern management starting September 16th. So if you are not in any of the cities that we are traveling to and you want to jump on board, we're doing a big revamp of the program. Um, I encourage you guys to sign up for your fall CEUs. All right. So today we are going to talk about sarcopenia and why PTs should essentially care about assessing and trying to treat for sarcopenia. So first thing, uh, sarcopenia is a clinical geriatric syndrome. What we mean by that is a constellation of signs and symptoms across multiple organ systems that leads to vulnerability in different areas of a person's life. So these are pretty much like umbrella syndromes that we see with uh, increasing age being the biggest risk factor for their development. So things like delirium, dementia, falls, frailty, sarcopenia, sometimes urinary tract infections can fall under that umbrella as well. And so sarcopenia is probably one of the biggest clinical geriatric syndrome that we're going to see in our day to day practice. And we're going to see this in all practice areas. So of course, it's going to be more common in acute care, home health and hospital inpatient outpatient settings. But my orthopedic in, uh, private practice uh, therapists are going to be seeing this a lot too, because this is clinical muscular weakness. So when I'm talking about that, I don't mean cachexia. So these are two very different terms. Sarcopenia is clinical muscular weakness that is contributed largely to age. Cachexia is muscular uh, wasting muscular weakness that is often related to some sort of disease state. So for example, if somebody goes into hospital for an exacerbation of chronic kidney disease and they're in bed for a while, um, what's going to happen is cachexia is going to happen where you're going to see uh, muscle weakness because of the kidney disease, not because a person is three days older than they were before. So it's important that we understand that these are different terms, that uh, the decline in muscular strength is happening from a different, for a different reason, though you can have overlap. So you're still getting older as these chronic disease states are starting to develop. And obviously we know that chronic conditions increase their prevalence with age. So they can have overlap, but they are very uh, distinguishable uh, different types of conditions. So why do we care about this? Well, if we're seeing clinical muscular weakness, that means that individuals are getting to a certain level of strength or lack of strength where it is starting to interrupt their ability to be independent in their homes. And oftentimes, even if we see a patient that has large amounts of multimorbidity, one of the biggest things other than um, incontinence that is going to drive that transition from the family to uh, start thinking about alternative uh, living facilities is going to be that muscular weakness. Because if we're starting to see um, having individuals having a hard time doing day-to-day -day tasks, then their increased risk of falls, they're not likely to be getting all their ADLs and IADLs completed appropriately, or things just start to slip, and then family members often get worried, and these conversations around transitions in care and transitions in living situations start to happen. So if we as PTs who make exercise our jam, one of the things that we can do, obviously, is to start applying um, some screening for individuals who could potentially could be sarcopenic and we can start implementing exercise based programs because of this, especially because sarcopenia has been labeled as a clinical geriatric syndrome. It does have a diagnosis. Oftentimes we can make this argument for uh, trying to start care in order to help people stay in their homes for a little bit longer. And so what are the risks? So we know that we're going to have a decline in strength over time. We have about a 3% decline in functional capacity after the age of 60. The average age for a person to be diagnosed with sarcopenia is around 70. So if we're doing 3% for 10 years, we could see a 30% drop in capacity after the age of 60. So that is probably where that threshold is going to start to develop. 
that I'm sorry, I'm making sure that I'm getting my stats right as I'm looking across. There is estimates that probably up to 30% of individuals who are over the age of 65 can be developing some sort of sarcopenia. So that is a significant amount of our older adult population who may have some underlying weakness that is threatening their independence and making them vulnerable so that they are not able to live the life that they want to. And so we have a role to play in how we are going to help some of our older clients get stronger because we start to see these changes that are happening from a physiological perspective that we can at least mitigate the decline. So I'm not gonna stand up here and say that we're gonna be able to stop any decline, but we know that individuals respond to strength training by improving their innervation of motor units and we can have a little bit of cross-sectional area increase in hypertrophy that happens at any age, especially if a person is deconditioned and is going into a structured exercise program. So how do we diagnose this? Because that's gonna be the key point, right? We need to make sure that we have good diagnostic criteria so that we can make the argument that this person is meeting the criteria for a clinical level of muscular weakness that we can now help to prevent. And this is where the research world is uh, starting to clash. So there are multiple working groups across the world Asian, European, and North American working groups who have slightly different variations in their diagnostic criteria for sarcopenia. Um, But we do have some general things that we can do in order to try and get a diagnosis. So the important part for when we're diagnosing sarcopenia is that there has to be a sign of low muscular um, density or low muscular size, and there has to be a, a diagnosis for low muscular performance. So there has to be a physiological piece where we see that there literally is a a decline in muscular volume and then there has to be a performance piece and I love it's only been in recent years that the muscular performance side has come into it um, which is baffling to me but I'm glad that this change has happened because you know we we need to know that the amount of muscle mass that a person has on their body is transitioning into a performance part because the performance part is the key so Some of the um, outcome measures that we use from the muscular performance side when we're making a diagnosis of sarcopenia are things that are often in our toolbox anyway. So they include the six meter walk test for gait speed, hand grip strength, SPPB, which are probably the top three. And so something that we are probably already doing, um, we can use to kind of inform our decision around uh, sarcopenia and start helping initiate a diagnosis for Uh, in terms of making a case for continuing care. So when it comes to the changes in the working groups for um, diagnosis of sarcopenia with the six meter walk test, we're thinking that it's anywhere between 0.8 meters per second and one. This is the big debate when it comes to gait speed and geriatrics in general. So 1.0 meters per second we're thinking is more around community ambulation. So individuals being able to walk across a crosswalk safely without um, not being able to make it the whole way Um, versus 0.8 we kind of think about in terms of mobility around the home, um, just in terms of getting around in your day-to-day ADLs are usually in the 0.8. So it depends on your setting. Probably in an outpatient setting, I would think more that I would use the cutoff of 1.0. If I was working in an acute care home health where individuals aren't doing as much outside of the home, I would probably use a 0.8 depending on, you know, what your circumstances are. Um, Both have literature to to support them. The other muscular performance um, measure that we can use in terms of diagnosis for sarcopenia is the short physical performance battery. So this is a 12 point scale three outcome measures. We have a five times sit to stand. We have a gait speed test, which includes acceleration and deceleration. So you can't use it for an accurate gait speed measure um, in terms of um, trying to find a normal or fast gait speed. And it has a balance measure where individuals go from standing with their feet close together into a tandem stance to assess uh, their balance. And so there is some literature to support that individuals with an SPPB score under eight Um, are considered sarcopenic or are um, exuding some symptoms of low muscular performance that may uh, link to a diagnosis of sarcopenia. And if you're listening to this and you are in home health or you're in acute care, you're probably going to tell me, well, Christina, every single person on my caseload is under eight on the SPV. And that is when I say, exactly. Um, That is exactly why um, this is going to be a really, really important thing for you guys to be talking about and thinking about as you start making your clinical decisions 
because if we have individuals who are showing performance deficits in the SPPB, we may have them with just generalized clinical weakness. And therefore, you know, these general lower extremity focus often um, exercise programs, which are focusing on progressive overload and specificity for ADLs are going to be really, really beneficial for our clients. So the physical performance side is something that PTs probably have in their wheelhouse all the time. The second one um, that we use a lot is we have to have a measure of muscle mass and often not what we would assess um, as PTs, but something that potentially we can get uh, or start advocating for our clinicians to start or our physicians, sorry, to start uh, screening. And so usually what they'll use is a DEXA scan or a bioelectrical impedance um, type of measure. The only issue with the BIA, which you've probably also seen at a gym where people try and gauge your body fat percentage by getting you to stand on pads or hold on to a um, like an electrode type probe thing, um, is that the BIA is very, very sensitive to previous activities. So if you've been sweating um, and hydration status, and so it can really um, underestimate or overestimate. There's a big margin of error with the BIA, which can make it really hard to see changes over time. If somebody comes in in the morning and hasn't had any water versus at the end of the day where they're four or five pounds heavier and they've had a lot of water, um, the amount of muscle mass that they're going to be showing on their bioelectrical impedance measure is going to be slightly varied and the swing in the error measurement may make um, making decisions difficult. So usually the gold standard is to use a DEXA and so they have cutoff scores for amount of muscle mass. So to have sarcopenia, usually it's between 7.0 and 7.23 kilograms per meter squared for men. Anything under that in terms of the, um, that's like the volume of mass across the entire body. And for women, it's between 5.4 and 5.67, anything under that kilos per meter squared based on whatever working groups uh, criteria that you are using. So if we are able to hopefully get some sort of muscle mass, um, like a number or gauge of muscle mass, we can make the argument with the muscle mass measure as well as a physical performance measure that there's a clinical uh, amount of weakness that's going on there. And so if we know that individuals are starting to develop sarcopenia, especially if we can kind of start to catch it before where you're, you're starting to see this decline in mobility, people are saying that they can still do everything that they want to, but they're starting to have to take more breaks or they're altering the way that they're doing it or they feel like they're more fatigued after they're doing things that before were a lot easier, this might be where we're going to start having to really start to you know implement these exercise programs, try to advocate for you know the the role that physical therapists can play in, in terms of helping you know prevent any further transitions into worsened sarcopenia. The other thing about sarcopenia, which is low muscular performance, low muscular strength, is that it's also a big component of frailty. So oftentimes when individuals are starting to have these underlying weaknesses, it can really start that cascade where people are going further along the spectrum into frailty. And that's not what we want to be seeing for our clients. So especially with physical therapists who tend to be, you know, these first points of contact or in the outpatient setting where we can really start to advocate for the need for strength training or the need for an exercise program that is going to be targeting these weaknesses. That is a great way to kind of prevent any slides in the, in the level of function of the individual. But also when you're in home health or acute care, that's something that we are gonna be thinking about in terms of how we're making our clinical decisions. So one of the things that I see a lot when I talk to different clinicians across the US and internationally now with some of our online courses is that oftentimes we don't get a lot of information in our PT degrees around clinical geriatric syndromes, which I agree, I didn't have a ton of exposure to things like frailty and sarcopenia, which is really sad because it is something that we see every single day if we're working with older adults. And it guides my clinical reasoning because I have now a framework of justification for my treatment plans. And it makes me think very globally because these are multiple systems, right? When we think about geriatric syndromes that are affecting the physical presentation of the individual, they may have subclinical kidney issues, liver issues, cognitive issues, et cetera, et cetera. And instead we don't really need to think about you know treating those individual things we have physicians who are going to be treating those but we know that those percolate down into uh, impairments in physical function 
So I hope you guys found that helpful. Um, if you guys are um, looking to jump onto one of our live courses, we're in California this weekend, but then we're in um, Minneapolis, September 7th, and then we're in Wyoming, September 14th, then we're in Montana, October 5th. We have a whole map on the PTI Nice website of where we're going. I'm gonna know all of the states of the US as a Canadian. I'm gonna be able to win that game where you have to try and write down all of the states. Um, because I'll have visited them all, hopefully, through the Modern Management course. Uh, if you guys have any other questions around sarcopenia and its assessment, um, put them in the comments below. Try and tag me personally. I tried to look back, but if you guys have seen the IS Facebook page, it is overwhelming with people having amazing conversations around PT. Um, so tag me and we'll continue this conversation offline or online. Bye. Hey, thanks for tuning in to the PT on Ice Daily Show. If you enjoyed this content, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. And be sure to check us out on Facebook and Instagram at the Institute of Clinical Excellence. If you're interested in getting plugged into more ICE content on a weekly basis while earning CEUs from home, check out our virtual ICE online mentorship program at ptonice.com. While you're there, sign up for our Hump Day Hustling newsletter for a free email every Wednesday morning with our top five research articles and social media posts that we think are worth reading. Head over to ptonice.com and scroll to the bottom of the page to sign up.